Uh, thank you very much, Monica, for the kind words. And thank you for attending today. So just to give you a little rundown on what we are going to do today. Uh, the first 20 minutes is going to be a very, very brief summary on how to fit my lenses. It will be a speed course, so please stay awake through that. It will be very quickly. And uh, from there, we will actually move to two patients where we have time to do one eye on both those patients, and we'll just show live fittings and ask you to judge the fit, just to show you a couple of, of designs that will be used on the cornea. So if we can start, we we'll probably need you to sit down on the front there. <laughs> Thank you. So you have to ask the question, why is Rose K used so universally through the world? It's now sold in 90 countries, and it's by far the most widely used brand uh, in the world today. So how's that come about? It was never in my wildest dreams that that would ever happen. When I started fitting keratoconus back in the 70s, uh, you required high skill of, of skill. You had a very low success rate. You often used three or four lenses to get the final lens. Very time consuming for the patient, for the laboratory, uh, and for the practitioner. And I typically ended up with experts. Most practitioners didn't want to bother to fit keratoconus at all. They often referred them off. So you ended up with experts in each city. So what was my reason for designing Rose K? To try to make it simplify the whole fitting of a regular corneas. I wanted to make it so that if you could understand a fluorescent pattern and fit a normal corneal lens, that you could fit my designs. When I started off and we, uh, we had to create our own designs, you had to state that the optic zones, the se secondary curves, and typically the trial lenses were nothing like the final lens power. Often in keratoconus, minus 20 is not uncommon. And your trial lenses were then minus 3, so you had these huge over refraction. So I decided to actually, in my designs, to set these parameters so that you didn't have any option. You couldn't state the back optic zone. You couldn't change the secondary curves. And I came up with a five-step five fitting system, which, if you followed, gave you a very high success rate. So can one design fit all types of irregular cornea? Unfortunately, not. And from my first design in 1990, which was specifically for oval cones, I have then progressed to other designs the, although it's called post-graft, it, it is suitable for any post-surgical condition like LASIK or any other type of condition. And then these other designs have progressed through the years. The nipple cone is uh, only about 5% to 10% of cones that you'll see. And then the larger semi-scleral or corneal scleral lens uh, in 2013. And more recently, <coughs> I have a soft lens for keratoconus. Uh, it's only useful for early and moderate cones, but we will be doing one patient today with a soft lens. So for those that understand my designs, you've got a range of designs that now will cover just about any irregular cornea condition that you will come across. If you follow, there is a very, very extensive fitting guides to follow, and you don't have to think about the design. As the disease gets worse, the designs change to actually incorporate what is happening on the cornea. So you don't have to think about optic zones or changing secondary curves. Typically, there's been many studies done on my designs. And once you're familiar with the designs, you should expect an 80% plus success rate with your first ordered lens. So it's uh, a very high. So when you're ordering my designs, what do you order? You have to state the type of design that you want. Obviously, the base curve is very important. The edge of the valley, which I'll cover in a moment, the diameter and the power. So there's five things that you need to state. I just want to take one moment to talk about topographies. I get set maps from around the world like this. And the first question I ask is, what scale did you set your topographer to? And they'll often look at me and say, well, what do you mean? Because a lot of people don't understand that the scale set on the topographer is very, very important. The map on the left here and this map are exactly the same map. 
The only difference is the scale the topographer has used. In this one here, anything steeper than 6.75 is represented in that one color. But here, we've got a much higher steep position, so we get a much better differentiation of the colors. So how do we get that? We use the normalized scale. The standard scale may not be the best scale for what you're trying to understand the shape of that cornea. Normalized scale is the best scale to give you the best picture of what the profile of the cornea is. So a standard or absolute scale will set, be set by the topographer and may not be applicable to the cornea that you're looking at. Whereas if you set it to the normalized scale, it will only include the ranges of curvatures that that eye has. So it's specific to that eye. And it is much better at determining the corneal shape. So how does that change the images? That's absolute. And then I set the scale to normalized. And you can see the difference in the patterns. Absolute, normalized. So please set your topographers to the normalized scale you'll get a much better idea of the shape of the cornea. The other option is tangential versus axial. Tangential talks about the shape of the cornea. Axial talks about the power at any point on the cornea. I find, prefer this one. I find it gives me a, the most accurate picture of what happens when I put a contact lens on the eye. So I prefer to use tangential. And you can see here the difference, tangential, the same map with the axial, and you can see what happens. What happens with axial maps is they tend to exaggerate the decentration of the cone and the size of the cone. They make the cone look bigger than it actually is. So my preference on topography is to have normalized, tangential, curvature, and monocular. Always view the maps monocularly. That will give you the best scale for that map. If you do it binocularly and the two eyes are very different, your scale might, might be much, much bigger. So we need to begin with my designs. You identify the condition that you are fitting. Sorry. You choose the appropriate Rose K design, and then you follow the five-step fitting system. So the five steps I recommend for my rigid lens designs you always start, and this is the order that you approach the fitting in. You start with the central fit. You then move to assessing the peripheral fit. You then look at the size of the lens, how it locates, and how it moves. So that's what we're going to take you through now very quickly. So let's look at the central fit. And this is a, a corneal lens, a Rose K2 corneal lens on a normal oval cone. So what we're trying to achieve is what we call light feather touch, as you see here in the right video. This shows a little bit too much touch. This shows no touch. So you're going to vary your base curve until you achieve that pattern centrally. Very light feather touch. When I talk about touch or feather touch, you actually the lens is actually not touching the cornea. You just don't have enough depth of fluorescence to get fluorescence. So topographers understand that. And if you look at simulated fluorescent patterns, which some topographers produce, when you have feather touch, you still have about 20 to 30 microns of a tear layer at that point. So we're not actually touching the cornea. What about peripheral fit? So once we got the central fit right, we move to the peripheral fit. What we're trying to do is to end up with a fluorescent band 0.6 to more than 8 millimeters wide. You judge it in keratoconus in the horizontal meridian because that's where the edge lift is going to probably be the tightest and the lens must be centralized with the patient looking straight ahead. So this is a, an ideal edge lift. That's what we're trying to achieve. So how are we going to change that? I'll show you in a moment the scale that will change that for you. So if you put your trial lens on, and this is what you see, this has a too much edge lift. You want to shut it down. Here, we have no edge lift. 
that will cause those tears never to be exchanged and therefore it will reduce your wearing time. With an excessive edge lift, the lens becomes uncomfortable and it moves around quite a lot. I came up with a scale which I, um, I use from in the keratoconic design from minus 1.3 to plus 3. So basically to the right, you're increasing the lift. From here down, you're decreasing the lift. So if you put the trial lens on the eye and it has too much lift, you're going to use one of these values down here. That might sound all very complicated, so I decided to choose three standard lifts. And you'll find that the standard lift, which is most of the trial sets, will fit around 60% of the corneas you see. You'll need to go to the increased lift in about 20% and need to go to the decreased lift in about 15%. So typically those that start to use Rose K tend to choose the three standard lifts for a start and then when you get confident, you can fine tune the edge lift anywhere up and down on that scale in 0.1 steps. And Monica, do you use the scale a lot? You You do too. Rather than the numbers we can so this can change exactly how you can very precisely fit that peripheral cornea. What about the diameter? Each design has a standard diameter, but you have a big range of diameters within the design. For example, if we take the keratoconus lens, the most used diameter in the world is 8.7, but you have a very large range for small eyes and for very large eyes. So. What are we trying to achieve for the keratoconic design? We're trying to just hang it off the top lid so it locates centrally over the pupil. This is too big and this is too small. What about location? Ideally what we want to see with the corneal lens is the lens locating nicely over the pupil. However, very often with keratoconics we see this with the lens locating low. Why does that happen? Is because the apex is often descended down in keratoconus. The lens will want to always go to the highest point on the cornea. So whether the high point is in graphs, you'll find if there's a high point on the edge of the graft, the lens will tend to want to move towards that high point. So in keratoconus, it tends to want to sit down because the apex is down. How do you fix that? If it's riding low, you can increase the edge lift. This will help it ride higher. You can make it bigger. That will help it ride higher. Or you can make it flatter. If you flatten the base curve, that will also make the lens ride higher. Here's a very good video comparing those factors. Now, if you look at this video, this was the indicated trial lens from the fitting guide of 6.6 .6 in a standard edge lift. Look how that lens constantly wants to drop down. I push it up and it drops down. It also has some bubbles within the optic area which suggests that I might be a bit steep in my, in my base curve. So the next lens I chose was 0.2 flatter, slightly bigger, and I went to an increased lift, plus one. And you can see the difference in the edge lift here. This is quite closed and this is getting more open. So what happened then? Immediately the lens sits up much better. We don't see it crashing down like we do here. We see it locating on the blink and sitting up very nicely. What about this scenario? Here's a lens that's sitting up very high and we saw one of these at um, Monica's clinic yesterday where the edge lift was too high causing the lens to locate very high. This lens is also flat. You can see it's impacting on the cornea. Here what I did, I didn't bother to change the base curve just to see what would happen if I changed the lift. I went to a 0.7 decreased and immediately the lens sits down. Very simple way to control the position of your lens. The other thing I mentioned on location was base curve. The base curve you choose can affect where the lens sits. 
These are all Rose K lenses, standard lift, which is zero, on the same eye. This is the flattest, this is the steepest, and these two are in between. What do you notice? The flattest lens rides the highest, the steepest lens rides the lowest. And the lenses in between both sit around about the same position. The other thing to notice is that although these are all zero lifts or standard lifts, look how much the pattern at the edge varies. This is too open, this is closed, this looks good, or perhaps a little bit closed, and this looks extremely good in the edge lift. What's the moral of the story? Always get your base curve right before you judge your edge lift. If you don't, you will not get the, the correct, you will not choose the correct edge lift value. What about lens movement? How does lens movement get affected? So you can see that lens moving. We want to ensure tear exchange. One to two millimeters is ideal. What controls it? Mainly the edge lift value. In these series of three videos, this is exactly what we want. All I've done is tighten up the edge lift. So this is tighter than this one, and this is getting very, very tight on the edge lift here. What happens when we tighten it? We don't get so much lid attachment the lens is not moving quite so much. What happens when we tighten the edge lift further? Hardly any movement at all, and the lens doesn't contact with the lid the same. So your edge lift value controls your movement more than any other factor. Because we're going to be doing a, a XL fitting today and a soft lens fitting, uh, I'm going to go directly and just tell you a little bit more about these designs. The XL design is a corneal scleral lens. What does that mean? It means that the, le the lens actually rests on the cornea inside the limbus, whereas a, a scleral lens vaults the cornea and it sits completely on the conjunctiva. So that's the difference between a scleral lens and a corneal scleral lens. So here is exactly the same process. You first start with the base curve. This is too steep, this is too flat, exactly the same as you see with a corneal lens. This is ideal, and this is a graft. Where's the highest point? It's not here, it's along the edge of the graft. So just think about where you have to assess the base curve. What I, if you have an OCT, you can check over your highest point on the cornea. This is a keratoconic patient, and you can see what I'm trying to aim for is 30 to 50 microns of clearance. So it's about 20 microns more than I want with a corneal lens. I talk about a feather touch in a corneal lens. In this lens, I'm now advocating the first lens that shows no touch. So that's a change in my philosophy because when I say to people go for feather touch, some people think feather touch is about four tenths flat. And so that caused me problems. So I'm now saying with XL Design, use the first base curve that shows no touch, the flattest base curve that shows no touch. Here's a keratoconus patient, pretty ideal. I could have perhaps even go 0.1 steeper there. Uh, this one I fitted, I thought I'd done a reasonable job, but this is a few years back. I would not leave that amount of touch. And you can see after 10 hours, we're starting to get slight staining over the apex of the cornea. So in that case, all I did was went 0.1 steeper, and I had no staining at all. So as I mentioned to you, I've recently updated the XL fitting guide. It will be coming out shortly. The flattest base curve that shows no touch is the lens choice for your base curve. Here's a uh, ectasia. It could even be a graft, but it was a, a post locic ectasia. And you can see as the patient blinks, you can just see it touch and then it's off. That is around about 30 to 40 microns of clearance underneath that lens. This is a pellucid. Where are we going to judge the base curve? Not here. Where's pellucid the steepest? Here. So if you have a pellucid case, don't judge it here. This is where you have to be looking down at the lower part of the lens. Thank you for putting those out. That's much better. 
This is graphs, and you can see that is very flat on the graph. This is ideal. We're just clearing the graph here. The other thing to notice is this lens here, even though it's very flat, is actually bound to the cornea. If you fit a corneal scleral or a scleral lens flat, it will bind to the cornea. If you fit a corneal lens flat, it moves all over the place. So just remember that as well, that it's important not to leave touch with XL. It will cause you problems. What about the edge lift selection? This is the next thing we look at, how we fit the peripheral cornea. One very good rule is that you should still be able to observe the conjunctival vessels through the edge of the fluorescent. You can see here we're starting to lose them. That's because the edge lift is too high. In that case, the lens would be uncomfortable for the patient and we would need to shut the edge lift down to the standard decrease lift. So insufficient fluorescent here, you need to increase the lift. Too much, you're going to decrease the lift. Just exactly the same as my corneal lens. And it's important to look all around the clock as to what is happening in different quadrants. Without going into too much detail, you have a huge amount of options with Excel. You can change the edge lift in any of the quadrants. So you can have a standard edge lift at the top, a decrease at the bottom, two double decreased over here, or whatever. You can put different edge lifts in each quadrant. So I just mentioned that very briefly. I'm not covering that really today. So this is a perfect looking fit. You can just see the vessels through. I'm very, very happy uh, with that here, and that lens would move nicely. This is too tight here, and it's a little bit flat. And this one is too open, and you can see what happens when you leave the edge lift too open. Small bubbles come underneath the edge, and they end up underneath the optic area, which will eventually cause you bubbling and, and visual problems, often within half an hour of insertion. So in this case, we would have to close the edge lift down. What about movement? With scleral lenses, we typically don't talk about movement. But with corneal sclerals, with my design, I talk about movement. I want to see some small amount of movement. Not nearly as much as a corneal lens, but I want to see some movement. So in this case here, you can see the lens, patient looks up, and you can see that lens just moving. Not as much as a corneal lens, but you can see it moving. Just to finish the presentation before we um, move on, Rose K Soft uh, is the last lens I did. It is for basically early keratoconus or moderate keratoconus, not advanced. Uh, it's available in 7.0 to 9.2 and 0.2 steps with a standard diameter of 14.8, but you can go up as high as 15.4 or as small as 14.2. The standard thickness is 0.35, this is basically designed for practitioners who don't want to use or don't feel competent about using rigid lenses. Uh, so why does it work? This patient, this is the same eye with different lenses on. This is no lens, and you can see the amount of irregularity on the topography. Even with an O50 disposable, you can see that amount of irregularity has been reduced. Once I put my lens, the O50, 0.35, we've basically changed the irregular astigmatism to regular astigmatism, and we can correct that on the front of the soft lens. So that's how it works. The other thing you'll note, when you use this lens, often the power, both in the sphere and the cylinder, will decrease. In this example here, the person's spectacle RX was, was this. When we used the uh, Rose K Soft, the minus power came down uh, by three quarters of a diopter, and the cylinder dropped from two and a half diopters to half a diopter. And in some cases, I've even seen cylinders from two completely disappear. So do expect that with this design that you will find less minus both in the sphere and in the cylinder. Space, if you want to make your chance of success good, patient selection is important. 
So patients who have failed with GP lenses repeatedly, uh, but not advanced cones, first time contact lens with irregular corneas. So those patients that have worn soft lenses successfully for many years, and then they start to talk about shadows or problems with their vision, and you find their cornea is starting to distort. Those patients are ideal for this type. You don't have to move them to a rigid lens. You can still get maybe a year or two or maybe longer with a thicker soft lens. So in India, there's different ways to fit this lens around the world. But because uh, uh, here um, Jody was concerned about uh, use con uh, using trial lenses uh, and the cost of them, we've gone to what we call the empiric empirical method. So all you do is you take the topography or simple K readings, you take the best spectacle corrected, you take the horizontal um, visible diameter, send these to your distributor who will calculate your first trial lens. That will be sent to you, you'll put it on the eye, you'll let it settle down for about 20 minutes, record any other over refraction and, re and look at the fit, and then you will order your further lens. In the Rose Cave soft guide, I won't go into detail about what changes you make, but there's plenty of detail both online on the Rose K website. Um, www.rosekaylens.com has got a lot of information on uh, all of my designs. Okay, I think, Jody, you want to say a few years before we go to the live fittings, is that right? Do you have one of these? So, uh, some of you here would have been doing these patients or things. So if there's any questions, till we just do the fitting setup, we can take up those questions. So, yeah. How many of you are already doing Roske contact lens fitting? Can I have a show of hands? While they're setting that up, is there any specific questions you would like to ask at all? So I think for the others who were not in the other hall where you were telling the benefits of uh, a corneal scleral lens above the scleral lenses, if we can just have a brief summary of the advantage of sclerals, because uh, the it's more popular to be fitting in those seal of sclerals here than that. So if they would understand what it actually means to the patient. I think um, Monica's comment there is very valid that with scleral lenses, remember, you are sealing off the eye. And there's many studies to show the longer the lens is on the eye, the less and less you get any tear exchange. So you rely a lot on the oxygen transmission through the lens, and that may not be enough to meet your daily requirements. So if you're fitting the scleral lenses, be very careful. You do not get problems with oxygen to the cornea. Um, in my travels around the world, I've seen some horrific looking eyes with scleral lenses on graphs. On corneal graphs, be very careful to monitor them very carefully if you're fitting a scleral lens. Okay, Jody, it's all yours.